Oh, poor Louisa. She's a ward of the state now, spends her days locked in her mind. She's completely gone from this world. Completely? She wouldn't remember what happened to Freddy's. Mary shook her head. Louisa's last lucid thoughts went into that book, she wrote. What book? Mary looked up at the ceiling. What was the title? It was sort of a cult hit a, f a few years back. Louisa wrote it right after her father died, dedicated it to him. Folks said that she actually wrote it because she he asked her to. Sorry, I'm messing up. <laughs> and for some reason, no one can explain. Right after that, she just faded away. Some say it was just a matter of time. She was only a baby when Lonnie died, but having bereft, bereft parents can scar a child. Mary tapped the counter with a gnarled finger. I can never remember the name of that book, but I have a copy. Most folks in Forkstop do. Her joints creaking audibly, Mary heaved herself from the stool and disappeared into her private domain. Dirk could hear her shuffling around and muttering, let's see, let's see, yep, here it is. Mary returned with a trade paperback book. She set it on the counter so Dirk could see the cover image of a prehistoric looking cross between a shark and a crocodile. Dirk gasped, grabbing the paperback. That's the dogged dogmatist. I love this book. He stared at it in awe. He couldn't believe it. He looked at Mary who was grinning at his excitement. I made up a game based on this book, Caverns and Crocodiles. Aaron Sanders' daughter wrote it, but it says Louisa Jewell. Dirk tapped the author's name. Jewel is her middle name, Mary said. Dirk stared at the cover of the book again, then looked up at M M Mary. <laughs> Maud. Uh, it is Maud. I, 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 I'm pretty sure it's Maud. I'm going to keep saying Maud so that you guys don't get annoyed. Oh, you're probably already annoyed. I don't even care. This is like the last few times I'm going to have to say it anyway, so I have to talk to her. Maud studied him for a minute, then nodded. I'll make a call. See if we can get you in with the little fib. They might let you in to see her, but don't expect much. Dirk wasn't very good at controlling his expectations, so he didn't even bother to try before he entered Matson's state hospital. Even setting aside how close he was to unravelling the mystery of Felix, he was about to meet one of his favourite authors. Ever since he discovered Louisa wrote The Dogged Dogmatist, Dirk had been reviewing what he remembered about the book. Maud had loaned him a, her copy of the book, but he hadn't opened it yet. He didn't need to, he knew the book well. The novel had come out when Dirk had turned 15 and it had immediately grown, uh, sorry, gotten a huge following, most of which consisted of people like Dirk, people who didn't fit in, who wanted to see layers when others wanted to accept things at face value. The novel was the story of a man whose determination to be right proved to be his undoing. Possibly, anyway. The ending was obscure, and people debated whether the man lived or died at the end. Dirk and Leo had discussed this ad nauseum. Leo was sure the man died. Dirk believed he lived. The whole book was obscure, actually. The gist of the story was a man on a quest to find the prehistoric shark-croc hybrid depicted on the book's cover. Oh, there you go then. <laughs> the man was led on his quest by a voice of intuition he heard in his head. The man's search for the creature was convoluted on the whole, but certain lines in the book went beyond convoluted. They just didn't make sense. Neither did the drawing in the middle of the book, an ornate and frilly sketch of what looked like butterflies and flowers. Butterflies and flowers! <laughs> the drawing was never referred to in the book, and it couldn't be related to any of the story. I wonder what that has a connection to. Maybe the other thing about butterflies in this story. <laughs> Were the odd lines in drawing uh, some kind of code? For what purpose? Now that he'd been in the water park though, Dirk knew, thought he knew what they were for. It was starting to make sense, if he was right. Inside Matson State Hospital, Dirk followed a red-headed caregiver a, a, down a long beige corridor. She looked to be about Dirk's age, but she was taller and very serious. After the caregiver made a left turn, she stopped in front of the second door on that hallway. She's in there, the girl said, pointing. So kind of you to visit your cousin. People don't come in often enough. Then she turned and walked back down the hall, her crepe soled shoes making funny, spongy sounds as she went. Dirk flushed at the lie. 
So I broke a window and told a white lie, he said to himself. People have done worse for less. Dirk stepped into a small yellowish room that contained one hospital bed, two visitors chairs, a recliner, a bureau, a nightstand and a TV on a shelf on the wall. The light in the room was dim and the space smelled like honey, vinegar and bleach, an odd combination. He looked at the bed's occupant. Louisa Jewel Sanders didn't look as vacant as Maud had said she was. In fact, she seemed alert. Her gaze was focused directly on Dirk. A fragile looking petite blonde woman, Louisa appeared to be in her early 40s maybe. She had small features, pale blue eyes, thin lips and almost translucent skin. Dirk had asked Maud what was wrong with Louisa and she just shrugged. Some kind of past trauma is, is the story. She's perfectly healthy, but she can't speak or function on her own. She just sits or lies in her bed and stares. Hi Louisa, Dirk said slipping into the room and walking softly to a visitor's chair. He hesitated, then sat a few feet from Louisa's bed. Louisa didn't say anything, but her eyes shifted to stay on him. Louisa was dressed in a simple moss green smock dress and white socks. The, the neck of the dress was scooped, and he could see she wore a necklace with a butterfly pendant. Wow! <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stop doing that. He gestured at it. That's a cool pendant, a zebra long-winged butterfly. I like those. Louisa might have been silent, but she wasn't out of it. When Dirk finished talking, she touched the butterfly's black and pale yellow striped wi wide wings. Dirk felt a jitter of excitement skitter through his body. He smiled at Louisa. I've always loved butterflies. Louisa didn't move. Dirk wasn't sure how to begin, so he just jumped in. I have a lot of good memories from my time in your dad's restaurant, Freddy's. We weren't in the town a long time, but I went to Freddy's every day while we were here. I liked visiting Felix. Do... He stopped. He was going to ask if she remembered Felix, but he didn't want to make her upset. Everyone else in Forkstop seemed to hate Felix. He talked to a few more people since he'd been with Agnes and Dawn in the diner, and they all had memories similar to those of the two women. I want to find Felix, Dirk said softly. I was hoping you could tell me if the Freddy's your dad owned is still, um, around. Dirk noticed a vein in Louise's neck was starting to pulse quickly. He stopped talking and hurried to change the subject, pulling her novel out of his jacket pocket. I love your book, he said. Louisa looked at the book, then looked back at Dirk. Dirk waited, not sure what to say next. Before he could decide, Louisa moved, and Dirk jumped in his seat. Louisa tilted her head slightly and reached up to unclasp the chain around her neck. Removing the butterfly from the chain, she held out her hand to Dirk. No, I can't take that, he protested. She held his gaze. He shrugged, leaned forward, and stretched out his hand. She dropped the pendant into his palm. What's this for? Dirk asked. Louisa looked away from the book Dirk held to him and back at the book again. Dirk followed her gaze and he smiled. He thought he knew what she was trying to tell him, maybe. He opened his mouth to ask a question, but Louisa closed her eyes. She was done with him. Dirk watched her for a few seconds, then nodded. He'd gotten what he needed. He was sure of it. Thanks, Louisa, Dirk said. He got up tucked the pendant in his pocket, left the room, strode out to his car, and drove back to his motel. In his room, sitting on his sagging queen-size bed and looking at the plush Felix, which swam on the scarred oak nightstand, he called Leo. Dirk, Leo said when he answered the phone. Everyone's been talking about you. I doubt that, Dirk said. Well, we have. Dirk knew we were his friends. Jenny says it's our fault you left. Gordon says you're too determined for your own good. Wyatt wants to go looking for you. He even started researching Freddy's locations. Tell him to stop. I found it. Or at least I think I did. Really? It's real? Send pictures. Well, it's... yeah. I'll send pictures. Dirk didn't feel like going into the whole water park thing. Listen, I'll... I called because I have a question. Do you remember that list of pointless clues we made from the dogged dogmatist? The ones you thought were code? Sure. I don't have my copy of the book with me. I have a copy, but not the one I marked up. I think I remember the clues, but I don't want to take the time to go through the whole book. And I want to be sure that I'm right. Do you have yours? 
Dirk heard a creaking sound, and he knew Leo was sitting in his rolling chair at the drafting table. The sound of rustling papers followed a couple of thuds. Leo kept filing cabinets full of scribbled ideas, and apparently he had a system that worked for him. He could always dig up what he was looking for. The rustling stopped. For a few seconds, Dirk waited. Got it. You remember the weird drawing, right? Yes, I looked at that in the copy I have here. Cool, want me to read the other four things to you? Leo asked. Yes, please. Leo read off the items while Dirk wrote as fast as he could. What are you up to? Leo asked. What's the novel got to do with Freddy's and the shark? I'm not 100% sure yet. I'll let you know. Where are you? Leo asked. I'll let you know when I figure this all out. Dirk said goodbye to Leo and told him to tell the others, especially Jenny. He wasn't angry anymore. He read over the short list Leo had given him and looked at his watch. He barely had an hour if he was going to get to where he needed to go in time. He stood and left his motel room. Instead of parking on the road as he had the first time he visited the derelict water park, this time Dirk drove around to the back of the park. He left his car near as uh, sorry, he left his car near the truff tr truff. I swear I said that word before correctly. He left his car near the truff that led under the fence. As he had the night before, Dirk came prepared, which hadn't taken much effort. His pockets held just his flashlight and the list he'd made when he talked to Leo. Dirk crawled under the fence again. Although it wasn't raining, he trotted over to the sheltered eating area to stop and think a minute. He perched on the edge of a cold, hard metal bench and looked out at the moss-covered structures pressing in around him. The sky held only a few clouds today, but here in the water park the day still felt dingy and dark, probably because of the overgrown vegetation. Dirk had hoped he'd be more comfortable in the park during the day, but the place still gave him the heebie-jeebies. He took a deep breath and forced himself to focus. The dogged dogmatists' the strange clues were the subject of endless analysis by the book's fans. Countless theories about them had been put forth. Dirk and Leo and Wyatt had come up with at least a couple dozen on their own. None of the theories had made sense until Dirk had started thinking about them in the context of the water park. The entirety of the novel takes place in a desert area, dry and rocky and utterly devoid of water. In spite of this, however, the main character receives two clues that are related to water. The first one directs him to a, a swimming hole, which doesn't exist and the second one tells him to follow the flow of water, which also doesn't exist. The character blithely ignores the clues, making them seem even more out of place. Was it called Chekhov's gun? Where, like, if something is mentioned in a story, it's, it, it, like, it has to be, it has to be, like, useful. Like, it has to be used later on in the story, right? It has to come back up. Otherwise, what's the point of them mentioning it? It's just kind of like wasting wasting words in a book. Wasting time. It's like Chekhov's gone or something. Um, the character blithely ignores the clues, making them seem even more out of place, and he ignores two others as well. The third clue the character ignores comes in a dream in which a wise woman tells him the butterfly reveals the key. No butterfly of any kind shows up in the book. The last clue the character ignores is the direction from his inner voice to be there at 3.33. Because the character never goes anywhere at that hour, Dirk and other readers thought 3.33 was some kind of numerology clue. However, now he thought it was exactly what it seemed to be, a time of day. And that was why Dirk had hurried over here. He glanced at his watch. It was 3.18pm. He didn't have much time. Dirk, of course, knew that 3.33 could be a.m. instead of p.m., but p.m. was coming first, so he figured he might as well make the assumption that p.m. was correct. If he was wrong, he might come back during the night. A rustling in the bushes at the edge of the picnic area abruptly plucked Dirk from his mental planning. He scanned the dense foliage encroaching on the shelter. When he spotted a pair of yellow orbs, he gasped, but then the orbs disappeared, and he realised they'd been small. He'd probably just spooked an opossum, or maybe a squirrel. Dirk stood. See, if that doesn't come back up in the story, this is definitely like a Chekhov's gun situation where, like, that has to be something. That must be, like, spoilers for the epilogues. That must be, like, Eleanor or something, <laughs> you know, right? Um, 
if the pointless clues in the novel were directions for finding Freddy's, Dirk needed to get to Floyd's swimming hole, which wasn't far from the sheltered picnic area. Thankfully, Dirk had gotten quite enough of poking around the spooky water park the night before. The Crawberry Flows water park might have been in a semi-urban setting. The intermittent shush and vroom of passing cars was a reminder of that, but it was being reclaimed by rural wildlife and vegetation. The night before, once the sun had gone down, Dirk had been <laughs> serenaded by crickets and frogs, and he'd jumped at the continual sounds of small animals moving in the bushes. Twice he'd been startled by owl hoots, this afternoon, the crickets were silent, but the frogs still had a lot to say. As soon as Dirk started down the narrow path that wound back toward the pool, he heard another sound, a distant howl. That made him freeze. It sounded like a coyote. Could a coyote get through the fence? Dirk picked up his pace. If his theory was right, he was going to find a way to get underground. The prospect of being in the dark tunnels he expected to find wasn't incredibly uplifting, but at least he wouldn't have to deal with wild animals in tunnels, hopefully. Passing a loading area for the river rapids on one side and a small supplier shed on the other, Dirk's feet crunched over gravel and twigs as he hurried around a corner and aimed toward the massive swimming pool he'd ignored the night before. Another howl echoed throughout the park and the breeze picked up, swishing tree branches and bushes. Dirk moved even faster. After just two more turns and a fight with the low-hanging branch of a, mo of a maple tree, Dirk arrived at the edge of a huge, empty swimming pool. He looked down into it, but he saw nothing except dirt and dry leaves, and the edge of what was probably a painted design on the tiles at the bottom of the pool. The design was barely visible. Most of it was covered by dirt. The breeze was picking up the leaves and swirling them around. Now what? Dirk looked at his watch. It was 3.24. He had just nine minutes to wait. Dirk started walking around the periphery, of the pool to pass time, frowning in concentration as he gazed at every little detail of the area. He found a quarter by the broken down diving board, but his investigation didn't turn up anything else. He checked the time, just one more minute. Looking around the area again, Dirk rolled his shoulders to release the tension. He didn't have any idea what to expect at 3.33, which made him feel like he was about to walk into something that was very more, that was more likely than a trap. Um, Every muscle in his body was taut. He pulled out his flashlight to use a weapon, uh, to use as a weapon if needed. Dirk watched the seconds tick past, and at 3.33 exactly, he raised his flashlight overhead like a club and widened his stance. He listened intently, swiveled his head this way and that. Nothing happened. Maybe it's something like a sundial? You know those, yeah? <laughs> like, the, when the sun's in, like, the right place in the sky, it will make, like, a shadow or something, and then it'll be like a secret code, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dirk turned in a complete circle. He stared at everything around him. He felt like he was in the middle of one of those games where you had to spot what was out of place in the picture. Something must have happened at 3.33, but what? You couldn't see any differences in his surroundings. Dirk squinted at the idea around him for several more minutes, and then, when the sun shone in his eyes, he moved in to the shadow thrown from the nearby water slide. Wait a second. Shade. Shadow. Dirk stepped back out of the shade and stared at the shadow. He smiled. I called it. The shadow was vaguely arrow shaved. <laughs> could it be? Dirk had seen something like this in treasure hunt movies where clues were often hidden in plain sight. Was it really so hard to believe this sort of thing happened in real life? Dirk looked at the end of the pool designated by the shadow arrow. The arrow seemed to be pointing to right under the sagging diving board. Dirk looked down at the bottom of the pool where the arrow nearly touched the tile. He couldn't see anything. He glanced at the ladder leading down into the pool. It was rust encrusted and he didn't think he wanted to see if it would hold its weight. He turned and trotted to the shallow end of the pool. Walking down into the pool, he headed to the spot where the point of the shadow ended. There, he knelt and scraped away several layers of dirt and sediment. He found nothing. Frowning, Dur Dirk sat back on his heels. Was he in the wrong place? He didn't think so. Was he missing something? He looked up at the water slide and passed the top of it to the sun. He gasped and snapped his fingers. The sun! The sun wasn't always in the same place in the sky at a given time of day, everywhere in the world, obviously. 
If 333 was related to a cast shadow, the timing would have to be precise for a particular location and time and date. If 333 was right for the time and place in the book, it might not be right for this date. Dirk grinned at his cleverness. Then he stopped grinning. What good would his cleverness do? He had no idea how to calculate the right date for this place and time. What now? Dirk sat down in the dirt under the diving board. He stared at the end of the shallow arrow. He blinked and leaned forward. The arrow had been had retracted from where it had been. As the sun moved, the shadow arrow was being pulled toward the middle of the pool. Dirk got back on his knees and he began digging the dirt away from the line cast by the shaft part of the shadow arrow. Of course, what he was doing was about as imprecise as you could get. Maybe at the right time of day, the arrow wouldn't even land in the pool, but he didn't think so. The fact that a swimming hole was one of the pointless clues in the book convinced him he was in the right place, so he kept digging. He dug until he got to the edge of the design he'd noticed on the tiles. His heart rate doubled. A design could be a clue. Why hadn't he looked there to start with? Dirk leaned forward and dug faster around the edge of the design. As soon as he'd moved just a few inches of caked crud, he realised he was on the right track. Part of the design was a zebra, long-wing butterfly. Panting in his eagerness, Dirk poured and scraped at the dirt until he'd revealed the whole design. He whooped. <laughs> whoop whoop! This is the place! The design on the bottom of the pool was a perfect match to the strange ornate drawing in the dogged dogmatist. Dirk grinned at the design. For several minutes, he ran his fingers over the whole design, searching for some kind of hidden handle or something. Nothing! He pulled out the list of clues he'd scribbled down and, and looked at it. Get to the ending! <laughs> the flow of water. Next must be the flow of water. He looked at the design again. Maybe this... Actually, I think I said this in my summary video. Um, I think this is probably the reason it was scrapped. It was just really long-winded. Like, there's so much, so many details here that, like, don't need to be here. Just get to the point. We understand the whole butterfly thing. We understand the whole dogged dogmatist thing. Get through the clues and get to the ending. <laughs> um, or at least that's how I feel. I don't know. It's, it's all right. It's, it's good tension, I guess. Next must be the flow of water. He looked at the design again. Could water flow from here? Maybe at one time, but feeling like an idiot, Dirk lay down on the ground and put his ear against the decorated tiles. If water was any place near here, it had to be under the pool. Maybe he'd hear it. Stilling his breath, he listened and he smiled. He could hear the faint sound of running water, but how to get to it? Dirk pushed up to a sitting position and looked around the bottom of the pool. <clears throat> Uh, was there a trap door or something he could go through? He knelt and started pouring at the dirt again. He brushed it further and further back from the middle of the pool, but he didn't find anything. Shifting to his butt again, he frowned. How could he follow the water? Dirk rubbed a filthy hand over his sweaty face and studied the pool again. He couldn't see anything that suggested a way to follow the water. Changing positions, he looked at the drain in the middle of the pool floor. It was only 8 inches or so in diameter, not nearly big enough for a person to fit through. Dirk crawled through the drain. Something about it looked weird, like it was asymmetrical or something. Had it been installed wrong, it looked thicker on one side than the other. Dirk reached the drain and ran his hand over it. Maybe there was a latch or something that would reveal a trapdoor under the drain or... Wait a second. Dirk changed positions and hunched over the drain. He pressed his fingers hard against the metal, si on, the metal on one side. Was he imagining things? No, he didn't think so. He used his now filthy fingernails to scrape out more dirt, he grinned. He wasn't imagining things. There was a depression in the metal at the one side of the drain. A depression shaped exactly like the pendant in Dirk's pocket. Wow, I'm so amused. Uh, Dirk, <laughs> I'm, I'm captivated. Dirk's breath came in eager gasps. As he jabbed his fingers into his jeans pocket, he pulled out the pendant and holding his breath, he pressed it into the depression in the, in the drain. At first, nothing happened. He pressed the pendant down more firmly. He was rewarded with a loud metallic click and part of the drain lifted upward. Dirk leaned over and peered into the tiny metal compartment that was revealed. Yes, he shouted. He was looking at a key. Oh my God, my voice is going to go soon. <laughs> 
With shaking fingers, Dirk reached into the compartment and pulled out an ordinary looking key. As soon as he did, the compartment snapped closed and the pen popped free. Dirk stared at the key in his hand. The butterfly revealed the key. How cool was this? He was in his own real life treasure hunt. The key had uh, to open a building that would lead him to the flow of water, but which building? Dirk picked up the pendant and returned it to his pocket. Then he held a key, feeling its grooves for a minute while he thought. Abruptly, Dirk jumped up and brushed himself off. Idiot! Where would you go if you wanted to follow a flow of water? The pump house! <laughs> Dirk ran the length of the bottom of the pool and up the slope of the shallow end as fast as he could. At the edge of the pool, he stopped for a second to get his bearings. Then he turned down a path to the left of the pool and he ran toward the pump house as fast as he could. I hope you guys kind of feel the same way as me. I'm sorry if you don't. But like it does feel kind of like long winded, uh, especially when it, it like this story had such a cool intro and it's really like mysterious at the beginning and stuff like, oh, there's this whole like mystery of this guy who, you know, his son died, the shark pulled him back up or whatever. Uh, then there's this daughter, blah, 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 dog a dogmatist. Like, it all seems really cool, and then it gets to this part, and it's just like, oh, wow, this is this, oh, wow, this is this. It's just, watching someone figure something out in a book isn't that interesting, I don't think. I don't know. It, it just seems really, like, obvious, like, this is what you do. Just as he knew it would, the key he'd found fit the pump house deadbolt lock. It took a couple of tries to get it to turn. His fingers sweaty from his run and his excitement kept slipping off the key, but it did turn and the door to the pump house opened. Dirk pulled out his flashlight and stepped into the murky space crammed full of dirty metal pipes. He turned on his, flash, his flashlight and closed the door behind him. Then he stood still to quiet his breathing. He listened. Here we go. After just a few seconds, he took a couple of steps and felt one of the bulging pipes. It was cool. He put his ear to it. He smiled. A flow of water was moving through the pipe. Dirk looked down at the key he still held. If he hadn't found it, there was no way he'd have been able to get in this building. Good thing he was good at clues and puzzles. Now all he had to do was follow the sound of water. Dirk shined his light at the bottom of the pipe and he saw that it and all the other pipes in the room dropped down through the pump house floor. He played his light back and forth over the dusty concrete. There had to be a way for maintenance workers to get down to the pipes. He spotted an opening that held a metal ladder bolted to its concrete sides. Dirk aimed his light down the opening and saw that the ladder disappeared in the oi into oily darkness. The pipes must run through tunnels below the park. Taking a deep breath and praying the ladder would hold, he descended. When he hit ground again, he found himself in a labyrinth of pipe-filled tunnels. Again, he was quiet until he identified the pipe that had water flowing through it. Then, putting one hand on the pipe and clutching his flashlight with the other, he began following the pipe through the blackness. Oh... <laughs> The flowing water took Dirk on what felt like the longest walk of his life. With just the narrow beam of his light to see and just the faint sound of the water and his hand on the pipe to guide him, it seemed like he journeyed for an eternity through a twisting and turning tangle of concrete and metal. It was a journey that tested his nerve as he never had before. There was a sharp terror t at the edge of every sight and sound, terror that he wasn't the only one in the tunnels and at the same time terror that he was the only one in the tunnels and would never be found if he somehow got lost. Dirk's expiration um, took more courage than he thought he had. Without that flow of water there was no way out of this complex maze of pipes and he couldn't be sure the water would keep flowing. More than a half a dozen times he thought about turning back and giving up. But Dirk wasn't a quitter and he was sure he was on the right track. The very fact that this serpentine trail of pipes existed told him he understood the clues. Aaron Sanders liked maze mazes and this was a maze. As long as Dirk could hear the water, he knew it would lead him to the destination he sought. And he was right. Just when Dirk's legs were turning to rubber and his nerve was diminishing to the point of non-existence, the pipe he was following ascended up through the opening in the concrete ceiling above him, and next to it was another metal ladder. 
Dirk didn't hesitate, he quickly climbed the ladder. He found himself in what looked like one of the maintenance buildings he'd dismissed on the first night of exploring. Oh no, how could Freddy's fit in here? He felt so let down that his legs nearly gave out. Had he been wrong? Aiming his light in a circle around him, Dirk caught his breath when the beam landed on the front door of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Not just any Freddy's, THE Freddy's. He hadn't been wrong. Dirk waved his light back and forth on either side of Freddy's door and he could see the moat-like glass enclosure going both ways. He'd found Felix's swimming tube. Who's the man? Dirk shouted. Thankfully, nobody answered him. What? <laughs> Dirk's legs re-energized and he leaped in joy. He did a little sort of dance of triumph. He'd done it. He stopped and frowned. The water looked murky, a kind of greenish brown, which made sense. The water probably hadn't been treated in a decade, but it was moving. Dirk could see variations in the dirt that suggested a flowing current. He looked for Felix and didn't see him, so he walked over to Freddy's double doors. Grabbing the handles, he pulled and the doors fell back. Yes! Stop saying yes! <laughs> Dirk shouted. His voice echoed down the hall and he followed the sound, grinning. The wooden floors were warped and mushy with age, so Dirk was careful to keep his flashlight aimed downward and his gaze on his feet. If he broke a leg, he wasn't sure how he'd get back out. Dirk watched his footsteps scuff aside dust that had, that had to have been uh, accumulating for at least 10 years. No one had been down here in a long time, probably since Aaron Sanders had died. Dirk could feel his pulse accelerating with every step he took. He couldn't feel if that was from excitement or anxiety, or maybe both. When he reached the bottom of the stairs that led to the main lobby, Dirk looked at the swim tube. Again, he tried to spy Felix. He didn't see the shark, but that was okay. The encircling tube was big. Felix could have been surfing some other part of it. Dirk took the black checkered stairs, two at a time, leaving footprints in the dust as he went. He couldn't believe he was so close to his goal. In the lobby, Dirk's flashlight cast creepy shadows across walls painted with murals, featuring Freddy, Chica and Bonnie. Dirk paused and turned in a circle, thinking about the man whose pain had led to creating this place, creating Felix. Dirk had thought about it and he was sure Felix was a memorial for Lonnie. That was why Aaron had loved this place so much he'd sacrificed his remaining money to get it hidden and have the pipe maze built. Oh, Dirk could understand that kind of grief and obsession. He thought he would have liked Aaron Sanders. He was sorry he didn't get to meet him. Guess what? He was a murderer. <laughs> I'm joking. Probably not. Uh, Dirk shook his head. Aaron Sanders didn't matter now. What mattered was that Dirk had known this Freddy's existed, and he was right. He felt the thrill of vindication, and of his quest nearing its completion. He wasn't sure he'd ever stop riding this high. Dirk continued on through the lobby, expecting to end up in the dining room. He stopped. The dining room wasn't there. Dirk frowned and shined his light around him. This was definitely Freddy's, but it wasn't the whole pizzeria. No wonder Freddy's could fit in the maintenance building. The only parts of Freddy's that was here, besides Freddy, uh, Felix's swim tube, Freddy's swim tube, were the entrance, the lobby, and a portion of the old arcade. Dirk flashed his light into the gloom, filled with dusty games. Goosebumps sprang up on his arms as the flashlight beam reflected off the metal and plastic surfaces. The old machines looked like frozen giants waiting to be thawed out and reanimated. Dirk shook his head and redirected his light toward the back of the arcade. The stairs leading up to the swimming tube hatch should be there. Oh my gosh, my voice is going. As Dirk followed his flashlight's glow, he heard a humming sound that grew louder as he got closer to the tube's entrance hatch. That had to be the water pump, still chugging along, still coursing water through Felix's domain. And there, he spotted the stairs leading up to the hatch on top of the swimming tube. As soon as Dirk saw the hatch, he began to strip off his jacket. He dropped it and his flashlight to the ground and he pulled off his shirt. Goosebumps immediately sprouted on his arms. It was cold in here. He hoped the water was as warm as he remembered it. He frowned, worried that he, the water might be cold. Should he check the heat pump? He cocked his head and listened to the humming. Now that he was here again, Dirk remembered the sounds from his past. A kind of layered rumbling, one hum, the water pump, a bit more bass than the other, the heat pump. Yes, there it was. Good. The water would be warm. Dirk rubbed his arms and grinned. 
He climbed the stairs and touched the cool surface of the circular handle on the hatch. The handle was called a dog, he remembered now. How could he have forgotten that? Why is that a detail I need to know? <laughs> he hadn't forgotten Felix, though. He hadn't misremembered or made it up. He'd been sure this swim tube existed, and it did. He also knew Felix was in there, and he was about to prove that he was right about that too. Not that anyone was in here to see that he was right, but that didn't matter. He would confirm he was right, and he'd have the satisfaction of knowing all his stupid friends who hadn't believed him were wrong. Dirk looked around the area near the hatch. It was dark with mildew, but the face mask and breathing hoses were there. Dirk remembered that at this point an attendant always helped to get you hooked up, but amazingly he remembered what to do. The face mask was cloudly, or was cloudy, so Dirk spit in it and wiped it as clean as he could with his discarded shirt. Once he had had it clear enough, he tried to put it over his head. It was too tight, so he took it off and loosened the strap. He put it back on, and this time it felt fine. He reached for the mouthpiece attached to the breathing tube, wiped it with his shirt too, and then put it in his mouth. Immediately, oxygen began flowing through the tube. Good. Everything still worked. Dirk couldn't smile with the mouth with a mouthpiece in, but if he could have, he would have. This was it. He was about to be reunited with Felix. He reached out and turned the dog on the hatch door. It turned easily, and he was surprised. He expected it to be rusted. Taking a deep breath to calm his heart, which was practically doing jumping jacks, Dirk lowered himself into the tube. As soon as he did, the hatch slammed closed with a clank, and the current pulled him along the tube, away from the hatch. Dirk flipped over and looked at the hatch as he was drawn by the flowing water away from the door and further to the tube. He frowned. What was bothering him about that door? Something. Before he could think through whatever it was that was niggling him, uh, niggling at him, he was carried toward another hatch, a few feet down from the one that he'd used to get in the tube. Huh? Oh. Right, okay. This one was on the side of the tube instead of the top. I got confused for no reason. Dirk was a little too nervous about the closed hatch he'd just come through, but he was also excited about seeing Felix. Would the shark come out of the second hatch? Dirk couldn't remember. The second hatch opened. Beyond the portal it was dark, but enough light had reached through the hatch doorway to reveal slow movement within. Dirk strained to see through the gloom. At first, he couldn't make out anything. And then suddenly, a huge blunt nose appeared, and Felix glided silently through the hatch. Startled, Dirk flapped his arms in the water. He half spit out his mouthpiece, and he had to quickly shove it back in before he swallowed dirty water. His heart rate shot up, and he could hear it thrumming in his ears. After all this time, Dirk had thought he'd be so happy to see Felix, but he wasn't happy at all. This Felix wasn't the Felix he remembered. Dirk's Felix had, a, had been a sleek, beautiful shark with shiny and smooth blue-grey rubbery skin. He had war- <coughs> Sorry, I got something in my throat. <laughs> he had warm, dark eyes that seemed to communicate both of the sadness Dirk remembered and the desire to connect with whoever came to swim with him. The Felix of Dirk's memories had a mouth full of teeth, yes, but the mouth was always- Upturned, smiling and benign, not menacing. Time had not been kind to the lonely shark stuck in this dirty water. Felix, even though he wasn't a real shark, appeared to be decomposing. His skin was no longer shiny or sleek. It was mottled, hanging in strips that fluttered out behind Felix as he swam. The ragged openings revealed Felix's corroded endoskeleton. Dirk thrashed in the water as Felix's toothy snout brushed against his side. He flailed to get away from the shark. In seconds, Dirk's eagerness had degenerated into full-blown terror. As Dirk struggled to swim away from Felix, Felix turned to look at him with his one working eye. The other eye was dangling out of Felix's face, a black orb bobbing in the water. Oh. Dirk almost spit out his mouthpiece again when a scream burbled up his throat and tried to erupt out into the water. This wasn't what he expected. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. He turned away from Felix's one-eyed gaze, but before he did, he tried to find some of the play friendly playfulness he remembered in Felix's expression. It wasn't there. Felix's stare was empty and dead. 
rotating away from Felix and swimming hard now, using his feet as flippers. Dirk squinted through his face mask, determined to get back to the entrance hatch as quickly as possible. He had to get out of the tube. Dirk was three-fourths of the way around the tube when his brain supplied the answer to what was bothering him about the entrance hatch. He saw the hatch in his mind's eye, and he knew what his subconscious had already figured out. The hatch had no handle inside the tube. There was no way to open it. Dirk again wanted to scream, but couldn't. Why hadn't Dirk remembered that the attendant was the one who'd stopped the current and let the swimmers out after a lap or two? Why had he believed he could do this by himself? As soon as Dirk had this thought, he noticed he was moving faster through the water, and before he could react, he'd whipped past the entrance hatch again. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw that Felix was closing in on him. Sucking in air through the mouthpiece, Dirk turned and tried to swim harder, but he felt something snag on his pants. He looked back again, and his eyes widened in panic. Felix's teeth were caught in the waistband of his pants. Dirk kicked his legs, but he couldn't get free. He grabbed at the material to try and rip it loose, but all he did was cut his hand on one of Felix's corroded teeth. Pulling back his hand, Dirk noticed he and Felix were getting close to the entrance hatch again. He prepared himself to try and grab it before he shot past. Three, three, two, one. Dirk reached out for the hatch and tried to find something to grip. His hand slid across the metal and he and Felix continued to whoosh around the tube. As the current carried Dirk and Felix forward, Dirk had to face the truth, like the dogged dogmatist had in Louis Louise's novel. Dirk had found what he'd searched for, just as he'd said he would. He'd been right, but no one would ever know it. A whale attempted to exit Dirk's body, and again, the mouthpiece stopped it. All Dirk could do was scream in his mind as he and Felix continued their entwined and endless journey through the bleak, turbid water. Finally, it's over. <laughs> I'm sorry, I that really dragged along at the end there, and I'm starting to lose my voice. So I don't know if you can tell. Um, I will say, really good beginning. I think it was a really good setup, really good ending. I I think the middle was lacking a little bit, <clears throat> and I must say, there are a lot of great ending lines uh, in all of these stories. But this one is really good. I'm going to read it again. All Dirk could do was scream in his mind as he and Felix continued their entwined and endless journey through the bleak, turbid water. It's kind of like a... I don't know. I'm going to try and make a missable details video on this because I, I've actually noticed quite a few details in this that's like quite like parallels and contrasts and stuff. But this is like a like a back and forth like screaming in his mind and then like they're like on a journey it's like journeys are supposed to be happy you know and it's and it's like me and felix are on a journey through the bleak turbid water we are completely hopeless um i i really like it i really like the ending to the story um yeah it's implied that he dies i i assume <laughs> uh but yeah it's it's pretty good it's uh, it's an alright story. It's definitely not one of my favourites. But tell me, guys, what you think of it uh, in the comments below. Yeah, make sure you subscribe. I will be covering the next story. Uh, there's a little preview. Oh, my gosh. Don't read the preview there. Oh, no. That's massive spoilers. <laughs> this one. This story. Ugh, I don't even know what to say about this story. But um, you're going to... You're going to enjoy it. I bet you are. So, um, I will see you next time for the scoop. <laughs> Bye.